Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, we're gonna be taking a look at something that I don't think has ever been talked about or shown on any YouTube video across the entire internet. I might be wrong, and if so, you know, definitely prove me wrong in the comment section, but this thing in here, I don't think anyone has ever seen. Now, just because this thing might be super rare, I don't actually really know, I couldn't find any information on it, doesn't mean that it's super cool either, but it's kinda of cool. It's a data terminal. So in this video, we're gonna take a look at the terminal. We're gonna see if it works, see how it works, and then take a look inside the terminal as well to check out how it's made, when it's made, stuff like that, and uh, run it through its paces. So without further ado, let's get right to it. So one thing that is proclaimed very proudly on the outside of the box is that it is made in USA. We'll have to open it up and take a look inside to see how many of the components are actually made in the US, like the CRT and the, all the various electronics. Maybe it should be assembled in USA. We have an address where this was presumably shipped to, and it is uh, Tualatin, Oregon, it's just south of Portland here. A company named Data Device, 10,005 Southwest Tualatin Sherwood Road. And we have the prod ID, production ID, I suppose, the serial number. So that's a relatively high number, 200 or 2 million, 127,377. I mean, how many of these terminals were really made? And a little bit more information about this particular terminal. So it's of course made for the domestic power system, 115 volts AC, ANSI keyboard. Someone wrote in a number there and US English keyboard again. And that is really it. On this side, same thing, just the brand information, a little bit of wear, and someone stamped the shipping address multiple times on the box. Kind of weird. And on the final side, nothing but just some wear, and of course, made in the USA. All right, let's take a look inside the box. This is like an unboxing of the most boring type, like the least interesting thing is in here, unless you're a terminal aficionado. I do love terminals, but I mean, I know their usefulness is pretty limited these days, but they're, they're still a pretty cool old piece of tech. So we have a box here, which is presumably the keyboard. Let's take a look. There it is, keyboard and a little bit of paperwork. Set that aside. And inside, there's the terminal itself, and looks like it's face down. Looks to be pretty clean. It's not in a bag, so I guess it's definitely not brand new, because I'm sure it wouldn't have shipped open like this. Let me extricate this from the packaging. Well, there it is, our first glimpse at the terminal. Looks like it's got a couple knobs on the side for brightness and contrast. Turning it around to the back, we have the serial ports. Tilt that up towards the camera. We have a Made in the USA sticker complete with a flag and everything. Made in the USA is there as well. IEC mains input. This one says parallel, so parallel I take it. SES2, so session two, aux, and SES1 EIA. So that's gotta be the main serial input and a second one, maybe for like a serial printer or something like that. On the sticker here, we have ADDS, 115 volts. There are some part numbers here. So 4320 must be the main model of this actual terminal. And then there's a longer string here, 4320 dash, 2303-7100. There is nothing on this sticker to indicate when this might have been made. And again, ADDS, I don't recognize that at all. Obviously NCR, pretty famous company. They make ATMs and office business equipment and stuff like that. So perhaps this was their terminal division at some point. And on this side, there is nothing except the keyboard input, presumably it's an RJ11. I am noticing that there's definitely some yellowing going on. Looks like this part of the case here is a bit yellowed. Overall, on the rest of it, it's in really good shape. There's something pretty interesting here. I noticed that there's this gap on the bottom of the stand and there's also a hole right here. And presumably you plug some cables in, power and these other cables, and they would loop down and you feed them through here. And it's actually open on the bottom of the stand. So I presume this is sort of a cable management solution. So the cables don't just sort of drape out the back. They're at least run on your desk. Maybe there's like a hole in your desk. So it just keeps it a little bit neater. The front of the terminal looks pretty good. I don't see any burn in, which isn't uncommon 
for terminals that had a high number of hours. Power switch here on the front and the ADDS logo. As for the keyboard here, so we'll take a look at this read me first in a second. We're definitely not reading it first. Wow, so there's the keyboard and it's in pretty good shape. It looks really nice. A little bit of dirt on it here and there, but overall it feels good and I don't see shiny spots on the keys. So I'm presuming this thing hasn't had a lot of use. Nothing unexpected on the bottom, just uh, and see as the keyboard layout is and it does say made in Thailand. So this part's not made in the US at least. Let's just take a look at this layout. So it's got a interesting enter key where the uh, backslash key is there versus up here. There's a composed character here. There's a large caps lock key. I'm assuming that's caps lock. Hold screen, print screen, setup, break key. There are F keys that go all the way up to F20. There's a do key and a help key. Got a couple status LEDs there. There's a find select key, stuff like that. And then on the top of the number keypad, there is PF1 through four, which is very much VT100 like. The feel of the keyboard is nice. It's linear. Let's pop one of the keycaps off because I think people will want to know what exactly we're looking at here. Oh, oh, well, I popped the whole thing off accidentally there. Let's uh, put that back on and try taking it off again. Oh, I see. So yeah, it's some kind of a slider and there's a little contact down in there. So I got to carefully reassemble this here. Okay, there we go. Let's try that again. I think I have to grip the keycap more on the edge of the uh, plastic, just so it doesn't take off the slider as well. Let's try that again. Nope, that happened again. Anyways, I'm not sure what kind of switch this is. We had a little spring. There's that little contact. It's split apart by the switch, the plastic of the switch there. So let's just try carefully to reinstall this. Okay, there we go. Hopefully that still works. We had some paperwork that was in the box. Read me first, looks like a warranty registration card. Nothing much to report other than the address there of ADDS. And what is this inside here? You can have a one year or a four year warranty, one year, no charge, or $50 to upgrade to a four year. Kind of interesting that this is in the box like this. I mean, I would think these terminals would all be bought by companies. Why would they need this in the box to kind of get companies to upgrade the warranty? Like, wouldn't that be negotiated by a salesperson while the terminal is being sold? It's just all a bit strange to me. It does say that the terminals are designed and manufactured in the United States, underscore for emphasis, to stringent reliability and quality guidelines. And then we have the fine print about the warranty, which I'm sure says nothing interesting at all. All right, I've been going on long enough. Let's test this thing out. One good thing is that the keyboard cable is permanently attached to this keyboard. I was gonna check to see if it was a crossover cable or not, because machines like the original Macintosh, if you have the wrong cable in there, you will destroy your keyboard. So that's obviously not an issue with this particular terminal. So that just plugs in the side, easy peasy. I have a power cord connected, and before I power this up, Let's all take a wager on what you think the color of this screen is. Amber, green, or white? Put it in the comment section below because I don't really know. The box I think said white on it, but I think that might've been for the color of the case plastic. Maybe gray was an option or other shades of uh, beige, for instance. I don't know if this is gonna be a white phosphor or not. So I guess here we go, let's figure it out. I mean, it might blow up too, right? So. Sounds like it's working. I heard a little chirp. Oh, there was a beep. Ah, oh, look at that. Paper white. Very nice. All right, I think I have the focus and the exposure locked. Maybe. The focus is definitely locked. Exposure, I am not so sure. So, this screen has a paper white display. And by paper white, I mean there's two different types of phosphor you can get on CRTs, on white CRTs. There's the bluish color phosphor, which uh, if you ever use a Macintosh, one of the original ones, that is one of the bluish ones. This is one of the paper whites. It's a, a warmer white tone to it than those Macintoshes. I think this was supposedly easier on the eyes, or so we were always told. But yeah, that's absolutely what this is. The little IBM 9-inch VGA monochrome monitor I repaired had a shorted cap inside. That also has a paper white CRT in it, although it's a little more tired. This one looks extremely sharp and very clear. 
I apologize for a little bit of flicker. I don't think this is running at the normal 60 hertz. This does not look like it has a standard NTSC picture either. I think this is some higher resolution than that. So on initial power up, verify, set up tab settings, answer back messages and function keys. To run diagnostics, press shift control F6. Shift control F6, there we go. Uh-oh, okay, so NVRAM checksum failed. Obviously there's some kind of battery in here. Shift control space to repeat. Oh, there's some more diagnostics running here. Well, that's a kind of a cool pattern. We can see right here, we have at least three shades of white. Well, so there's black, then two shades of gray, and then a bright white as well. And this is an interesting character that's displayed there. It's kind of pseudo graphical. Oh, look at that. Uh, the NVRAM checksum passed now. So I'm assuming after another cycle, maybe it programs something in there and it's fine. The battery is probably bad. So that's why that's not working. System RAM, okay, character RAM, character generator RAM. This may have like EGA style or VGA style graphics where it can actually generate character sets on the fly. Not sure if that's actually used by any of the terminal functions on here, but it may allow them to easily have localized versions of this terminal that were for sale in other markets that had kanji or other types of characters, stuff like that. All right, I'm gonna push the break key which is giving us a flashing cursor. Let's hit the setup key, which is F3. All right, let's look through these options. I know I'm sounding excited here, and the reality is terminals are not that exciting, right? It's not like there's any games or software you're gonna be able to run on this thing. Well, at least I don't think there is. You'd hook this up to something like a multi-user machine, like a Unix system with terminal server on it, and might have like 30 people using terminals like this. University environments, I recall very clearly using terminals at my university library, so this was in the early 90s, to, to access the book inventory system. Instead of using the old card catalogs, I'm sure any young people watching have no idea what a card catalog is, but it's a way to find books and we used to do it on paper. Well, when I went to college and I started using terminals to access the mainframe, well, whatever, it was like a Vax VMS system at our university to look up books and stuff, it was super helpful. And they had printers hooked up to all of the terminals on the back, that is those extra ports, so you could print out the little locator record so you could go find your book. Anyhow, let's take a look at these settings of this ADDS terminal. Jump or smooth scrolling. If you've ever used a terminal with smooth scrolling, what that means is it completely smoothly scrolls the text as you scroll. There's no jumping whatsoever. The negative of that is it's very slow, the scrolling, because it does smoothly scroll. So if you're listing a whole directory listing, it just takes forever to display, especially at one of the higher baud rates. At the slow baud rates that some of these old systems worked at, it didn't really matter. We have timeout on first key, whatever that means, space presentation, empty or dot. I think with this set to dot versus empty, anytime you hit the space bar, it will put a period in there and maybe even the full screen will just be full of periods. 80 or 132 columns, that's all possible because of the RAM based character generator on here. And it looks like we have a status line. So I'm gonna set that to both, just pushing enter on it, selects it. Let's put it to dot just to see if that works. Oh, look, it does. Puts dots on everywhere there's a space. All right, let's go back up here to keyboard. So key click on or off. Key click is actually coming from inside the terminal so you can shut that off. The rest of the stuff's relatively obvious. Uh, backspace code. So what does it say when you hit the delete or the backspace key? So that's like control H and I don't know what the Dell one is, something else. Keyboard mode, data processing, or typewriter. I think what data processing is, is as you type in text, it doesn't actually send any of it to the device on the other end of the serial port. It buffers it all until you hit enter. So you can correct what you're typing in and then hit enter and then it, it sends it. Okay, so what's under the general tab here? Margin bell, that's like the pet where it gets over the side, it will make a little beep. Cursor keys, new line, you know, it's all just uh, pretty normal stuff here. Here's the communication tab. So this terminal at least seems to support up to 38.4. Yep, it just wraps around. So it doesn't go any higher than that. It's a little bit disappointing if you wanna run something at 115,000, very common baud rate these days. But we'll open this thing up to figure out when exactly this terminal was made based on the chip dates. So we'll see, you know, if this is from the late 90s or sometime in the 90s and it wasn't going faster than 38.4, kinda lame. 
There's a printer tab here, which will be one of those other ports on the back. So it looks like aux in and printer connection. So who knows, there's some control codes you can send uh, on the, th well, the system this is plugged into can send control codes to then route this text that will be displayed on here to the printer port. And that's how it worked when I was in the library back in the day. Okay, and the final tab is emulation mode. So I am assuming this is all VT terminal emulation, VT320, 220, 152. The VT terminal series were all incredibly popular, popularized by Digital Electronics Corporation or DEC. And in my university, that's absolutely what we were using. They were like, I think there were VT220 terminals that were in the library made by DEC. And this obviously is a clone terminal that is designed to work with those standards. There were other standards besides these VT standards that were in use earlier on. So older terminals seem to emulate other stuff as well. And off the top of my head, I can't remember what they are, but as time went on, pretty much everything standardized to like VT220 or VT100. Linux trivially supports these VT standards. And the reason why these are important is because this allows things like the F keys to work or cursor positioning to work or it to be able to clear an entire line of text without having to like space over the entire line. If you're using something that doesn't have terminal emulation, literally all it can do is move the cursor back and forth and I think home it. And then it has to manually erase stuff by typing a space over it. When you have the VT emulation, there's a bunch of control codes that allow for clearing the screen and doing all sorts of other stuff, inverted text, large text, stuff like that. So let's change this over to VT220 and I don't know, we're gonna pick eight bits. I'm not sure that matters and we'll change that as well. And I think I'm gonna hit control shift space to save out of this. Setting saved, it says. And to exit, we push the setup button. So there's a cursor and there's a status bar, but it's very, very dim. Let's see if I can turn the brightness up. It's on this side. Okay, one is definitely a contrast control and one is a brightness control. Okay, so let's make it like that. Hit setup. Hmm, it's actually pretty dim. We'll know if this is working a little bit better once we get something hooked up to it with some text. Before we hook this terminal up to a real device, let's talk about who ADDS is, or who they were at least. It says they're the traditional leaders in the general purpose ASCII display terminal market. I have no idea what the word traditional leader means. But it talks about the Viewport series being one of the most successful product lines in that market. Anyhow, this document, which is from 1996, talks about that they have some new terminals, the 2020 and the 3220. And it looks like the 2020, which is right here, has a 14 inch flat face CRT, which is available in some different color phosphors, including smooth white phosphor, which I'm assuming is exactly what we have here. It's compatible with various types of terminals, including the original ADDS viewpoint A1 and A2, which is odd that this terminal is not even compatible with those anymore. If you notice right down here, it does have the address of ADDS and I'm pretty sure this is exactly the same address in New York state as that was on the warranty card for this. So even though NCR bought this company, seems that they are still at the same address. And down here at the bottom, it says that they were serviced by a bunch of companies, including NCR, which I guess ultimately bought them. This PDF I'm looking through is actually rather lengthy. It's 44 pages long and they make a whole bunch of different terminals like this one right here, which has several models available, including the 78, which has IBM 3278 emulation. That's kind of cool. But it seems like the history of this company goes back a little bit further than I thought. These pages back here are from 1979 and take a look at that cool terminal, the Regent 200. That is simply amazing looking. And it looks like this particular terminal was first delivered in 1970 or maybe 1974. I mean, they've been making terminals for a long time, although it says Data Pro Research Corporation. So maybe they merged or became ADDS, something like that later. And they even have the Envoy 620, a little lunchbox or luggable version of a terminal. Probably has a little five inch screen or something. Yeah, five inch 1920 character screen. How cool, integrated 110 or 300 baud internal acoustic coupler modem. So you took your phone and you stuck it on top of the case to make your connection. That's very cool. Now, when trying to find information on this particular terminal, the 4320, there is not a lot of information. There are these websites here, which are 
kind of like repair websites or something like that, like repair your broken terminal. That is definitely it. But after looking around a little bit, I cannot find any information on this terminal other than that one site. Like all of this stuff is for other unrelated things like terminal blocks and stuff. I did a search for the ADDS 4000 thinking maybe this is like a whole series of them. And yeah, that actually, no, that doesn't quite look like it. This looks more just like a PC keyboard. Look at that. That's a regular AT keyboard there. Although there does seem to be some similarity between this 4000 here with the PC looking keyboard. Cause check it out. It has that same tilt stand with the cable management on it. And the construction of the actual screen does look pretty similar. I clicked on the, what was a link to the manual, but this seems more like a product brochure. And this is definitely not the same thing. It says right here, it has a PC 104 keyboard. So yeah, definitely different. Selectable refresh rate, 60, 71, 82, or 100 Hertz. Interesting. I clicked on the user manual for the 4260 just to see, and there it is. It looks very similar again, but this one seems to have very different compatibility than the one we're using here, including PC terminal, whatever that means. Although if you notice here, it does say that it can come with several different keyboards, including an ANSI VT220 style keyboard. So maybe that's the one we have. It does say ANSI on the box, right? I'm sorry if you hear a bird chirping. There's a, I have the window open and there's a blue jay outside making a racket. Oh, look, take a look at this. There's the ANSI keyboard, which I'm going to say is the same. Yeah. And fortunately in this manual, the screenshots look like garbage, but this seems to be the setup here, which obviously looks completely different than this particular terminal. So I guess there are some significant ROM differences between this one and whatever is described in this manual. Here's the thing though, we are on the ADDS 4260 manual and it talks about the fact that this terminal is made by a company called Boundless Technology Equipment. And the address here, it's also in New York, but it's a totally different address. So I'm almost thinking that like this or ADDS somehow split and maybe Boundless was making them and so was NCR. And that's why there's such a difference with the way the ROM looks on the one I have versus this one. So if you're watching and you happen to know why there's different terminals that look the same but are different, I'd love to know why. All right, on the TV back there, I have a Raspberry Pi over composite hooked up to it. And I have that hooked up through a USB serial adapter to this. Now you have to use a no modem adapter because of course this is the equivalent of a computer and so is a Raspberry Pi. And anytime you wanna hook two computers up to each other, you do need a no modem adapter. So I have the keyboard here for the Raspberry Pi and if I type stuff, there it is, the letters are appearing. And you know what? They're actually quite a bit brighter than um, I was worried they might be. So I need to reconfigure this Raspberry Pi so that I can use this and get to the console of the Pi. Cause right now I was using that Pi with my Southwest Technical Products Corporation 6800 machine. In fact, if I hit enter here, it's gonna send what would be the basic interpreter that would normally be going to the Southwest Technical PC. So it's not super useful. Let me reconfigure the Pi so we can use this uh, as a terminal for the Raspberry Pi. All right, after much fiddling around, it is now connected to a Raspberry Pi, so I can run commands and stuff. I still have it running at 9600 baud, so it's not super fast. Of course, I could run it faster, but why bother? So the thing that was kind of throwing me for a loop was that in the old days, you could start a serial console pretty easily on Linux by just using the getty command, G-E-T-T-Y. Well, it seems like on Raspberry Pis, at least the recent versions, you have to use systemd, which is what I've done. It starts at boot and it seems to work relatively well. The one thing I noticed here in VI, this keyboard, it doesn't have an escape key. So the actual VT100 terminals do have an escape key. It's in the normal position you'd expect it to be. And this thing doesn't. This key here is hold screen, which is also like the F1 key. There is a, an overloaded escape over here, which I can use. So if I'm typing some text here in VI and I have to hit control F11 and, oh no, no, wait, shift F11. No, I <laughs> see that's just printing. Uh, wait, is this working? Yes, okay, hold on a second. I think I changed it. There was a setting in the setup of the terminal. Let's just try that again. So I'm typing text. If I just hit that key, okay, that's now the same thing as escape. So, oops, I can exit out of VI. There we are back at the prompt. So yeah, that's a little unusual because lots of things, well, I, uh, VI uses escape and the fact that's over here, eh, not so great. 
The real use case of this is if I need to hook up to something that only has a serial port, like the Southwest Technical Products computer, it's just one less thing to plug in because I just have to put power on this, plug it into the back of the machine or whatever, and poke the keyboard up. That's it. There's no computer, so to speak, like whether it's even a Raspberry Pi, which is sitting behind this thing, which can act like a terminal well enough. That's what I did a bunch of stuff on. But for quick and dirty terminal access, something like a terminal like this is pretty easy. Okay, after playing around with this thing for a while, I can assure that this keyboard works perfectly. All the keys work on it. The terminal is working fine as well. It's been on for about an hour and a half. No strange things have happened. So I think it's time to take it apart. It's been a little while since I've had it out. It's time for that 70s towel. There it is. Even though the terminal itself is definitely not from the 70s, um, it's nice to see this old thing. Okay, so let's see how we might open this. There are definitely two screws there. I see a screw on the bottom there. This thing seems to be in interesting shape. Okay, so my hunch is that this top cover here actually comes off leaving the entire base and probably the circuit board and a CRT and everything in here. I say that's the case because I see some gaps in the case right here that just look like it comes apart, um, leaving this whole bottom part as sort of a tray behind. I'm definitely curious to see what kind of construction this uses inside. Like example, is there a separate analog board from a digital board in here? Or is it all just combined into one, one sort of analog slash digital board that handles the CRT and everything else? So far, all four screws are exactly the same. That's kind of nice. Okay, does this just slide up? Yep, looks like it tilts off or something. <laughs> Look at that. There we go, just like I thought. All right, here we have it. So just as I thought, it is a combo board that's both analog and digital. The digital section is over there while well, there's a little bit over here as well. The CRT is a CPT, which I think stands for Clinton Picture Tube or something. It's a Taiwanese made CRT. So definitely that does not come from the USA. Okay, so I wanna pull this board out of here. First thing to do is pop off the two knobs on the side. And it looks like here next to the keyboard connector is a screw, sort of like a strain relief situation. Ouch, just got my fingernail caught under the little spring there. I'm noticing in here there's this box right here. You see this plastic thing? And it looks like the PCB goes underneath there. There might actually be like a card slot or something on here. Let's flip this on its side. It's not easy to tell, but there's definitely some kind of a door or something. You know, I actually can't say for sure if this is actually a door that comes off. It might like the plastic definitely looks like that is something that's added on, but it's, it's so tightly installed in here. I don't want to scratch up the plastic. Um, looking down in there, I can see an edge connector just sticking through into there. So the PCB should still slide out. How does that work exactly? Hmm. Seems like there's a few screws holding the PCB in. There's one there. I see another one here next to the knobs. And it might be free now. Let's see. There we go. It does come out. I will have to disconnect the CRT here. Let's see here, there is a deflection yoke. Unplug that. And we'll discharge the old CRT here. That's probably unlikely it's got any store charge. It has no store charge at all. I cannot thank them because it sucks. There's actually like a soldered ground wire here that goes from there to the PCB. Not even a connector. Not to mention this one here is also soldered on. Let's pull that off. That just came off very easily. So we can get this connector off the neck board. Hmm, that's pretty lame that this uh, cable is permanently attached here. I'm gonna have to unscrew it, I guess. Okay, so I loosened that. Let's get this thing out of here. So there's that edge connector I was talking about that goes into that sort of chassis thing there. I'm assuming this thing comes apart, looks like. This must be like for localization modules or feature modules or some kind of like personality modules or some other stuff that this thing could possibly do. 
Okay, let's take a look at what we see on here. So there's the battery. This is static RAM right here. These are 6264 LP, so two of those. That will be like the system memory. Actually, there's another one right there. So this could be like character generator RAM and uh, stuff like that. Look at this mess right here. Look at this. What is the deal with all these bodges? There's like multiple bodge wires, resistors. That's pretty ugly, I gotta say. Look at this bodge right here too. Bodged on top of a diode. There's this bodge. This thing is bodge-tastic. Looking at the date codes, 1991. So it's kind of what I was thinking that it was uh, from the 90s. So yeah, it makes sense. That chip is 1990, 91 third week, 91 second week. This IC right here is also a static RAM. So there are four RAM chips on here. Obviously this is a ROM code there, version 2.0. And this PLCC chip here says ADDS 200-97101, SMC 1990, uh, 24th week. SMC, they made a bunch of stuff that's commonly used in terminals, isn't it? I'm assuming a whole bunch of things are all integrated into this. This IC here is an Intel, well, it says copyright Intel, it's made by Signetics. Looks like an 8031. So I think this is gonna be a microcontroller for decoding the keyboard there because the wires come in and this is sitting right next to it. So this probably converts the keyboard and it scans codes or whatever that is used by the CPU, which obviously it's integrated into this large chip. So I gotta say, it's uh, kind of boring. The whole digital section is very small. And if you've seen terminals from like the late seventies, they'll have giant boards filled with TTL stuff. They'll have, you know, Z80 processors, other things like that. This has just got this little tiny thing here, super boring. If we flip up this board, which I think I can do, there we go. Oh, wow. More bodges. <laughs> Made with pride in the USA. More bodge wires. <laughs> oh, that is super funny. There is a day code on the PCB here, 15th week of 1991. So that's when this thing was made. If there is one thing to say about this terminal, it is well made. Like this plastic is very thick. It's not squeaky or anything. It's not flimsy feeling. It's very nice. And um, obviously this thing is quite clean inside. Like I don't think it was hardly used at all. There were vents on the top. So dirt, if this were used, would fall inside. And there's just no dirt at all. This thing essentially looks brand new in here. Like on the high voltage anode cap here, not a lick of dust. It does say danger high voltage on it. Yes, that is that is true. Now looking at this, uh, it's super highly integrated. And of course, there's no chance of any schematics. And of course, there's no chance of any kind of data sheet for this large IC here, which is clearly doing everything in here. I was originally hoping to figure out where the video and signal signals came from this digital section over to the analog board for two reasons. I wanted to potentially hook this up to RGB to HDMI to see that output, not on the CRT, but directly on HDMI. But also I thought it'd be kind of fun to inject video signals into this, potentially using this for other purposes than being a terminal. But the fact is like, there's no indication on here at all where the video is coming from. And if there was even like a, a video controller IC or anything like that, that could help but clearly everything is happening inside this, this one package. I thought the injection might work if this thing were running at NTSC frequencies, but I used a yellow LED hooked up to my oscilloscope to figure out that this particular CRT runs a 25 kilohertz scan rate with a 70 hertz refresh rate. And yes, in case you didn't know, you can use an LED as a light sensor. I'm just looking around on the board some more and yeah, there's just nothing interesting to see on here whatsoever. <laughs> It's pretty boring, I have to say. Um, there's some of that gunk holding these capacitors down, the stuff that can get conductive and destroy things, but they were really good with their application and it doesn't seem to be on top of other components. Like it's just strategically placed. So I don't think that's actually gonna cause much of an issue over time. And there we go. The terminal is back together and working properly. Before I put it back together though, I took the battery out. This is a UASA. NICAD 3.6 volt battery hadn't leaked at all, but you know, these things are little ticking time bombs are ready to leak all over your PCB and cause damage. So if you have one of these terminals or potentially any other terminal of this vintage, and it seems to have settings that are retained across reboots, it's probably got a battery in it and you should probably remove it or replace it. So that's it for this video. 
kind of interesting. It's a terminal that doesn't really exist, the NCR version of the ADDS terminals. That other version seems to have some documentation, but this one certainly doesn't. So if you have any familiarity with the NCR version of this terminal and maybe know a little history on why there's two different companies making a very similar terminal, I'd love to know. And can I replace the ROMs in this terminal with the ROMs from that other terminal so I can get more of those emulation modes? Because this one certainly is a little bit limited with only those VT100 modes. Not to mention, I honestly would rather swap this keyboard out for a PC keyboard if possible because that escape key limitation is really, really annoying. So I hope you found it interesting this little deep dive into this obscure piece of tech here. If you did, thumbs up. If you didn't, you know what to do. All that regular YouTube stuff. Huge thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. You can become a patron for early access to videos, plus uh, some of the higher tiers. Get other posts, pictures, video posts, stuff like that. So a little extra tidbits behind the scene, things like that. Um, subscribe if you haven't already. Second channel has got all sorts of interesting stuff on it, so I highly recommend you check it out over there. And if you hit subscribe on that channel, it really helps me out. So that is going to be that. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you next time. Bye!